We're at the fourth line on Daf Chaf. We were learning yesterday, and this is, will provide you with a sense of context and what we're about to see in the Gemara. We were learning yesterday that if a person discovers that he's wearing shatnes in his suit, even if he's in the middle of the marketplace in public, and it's the only garment that he's wearing, he has to take it off, even if it means he's going to be walking around naked in public, and he has to sacrifice his own personal honor, because we said yesterday that what? Ein chachma, ve'ein tvuna, ve'ein eitza, keneged Hashem. When it comes to God's commandments, one cannot say, well, my honor has a, has a priority. No, the mitzvah has the priority, and if it's a question between my honor, as it, my dignity as a human being, versus my violation of a mitzvah, <coughs> I have to make sure that I never violate a mitzvah. Now, Amr Le Rav Papa Le Abaya. Rav Papa now says to Abaya, Maishna Rishonim de Israche Shluhu Nisa, U Maishna Anan de Lom Israche Shlan Nisa. Why is it that earlier generations were privy to miracles when we today are not? Imishum Tenuye, maybe you'll tell me it's because they studied more Torah in earlier generations. However, Bishnei de Rav Yehuda, Kule Tenuye Benaziken Hava. He says, but that's not true, because in the, in the generation of Rav Yehuda, who, which was an earlier generation, perhaps it was one or two generations before the speakers, it says they only used to study the Bavas, the Bava Kama, Bava Metzia, Bava Basra, that's what they were masters in, right, in the laws of damages and so forth. However, we study all of Shas. We don't just limit ourselves to one section of Talmud and of Mishnah. We study all six orders of the Mishnah. So we study more Torah. And furthermore, Vichy Avamati Rav Yehuda Be'uktsin, when Rav Yehuda would, <coughs> would encounter a Mishnah in Uktsin, it's not that he didn't study it at all, but he, wasn't, he, he didn't have an expertise in that area. So where, when he would encounter a Mishnah in Uktsin, which is about the laws of Tumah and Tahara, dealing with the stems of vegetables and fruits, the leaf that grows from a vegetable or the stem that grows from a fruit, the halacha is that normally the stem or the leaf acts as what's called the yad l'tumah. It acts as a handle such that if a tumah source touches the stem, it transmits the tumah to the fruit. However, the Mishnah states, ha'isha shekovesha yerek b'kedera, that if a woman is pickling a vegetable in a pot, or alternatively, it could be referring to a uh, olives that you are uh, that you are soaking or pickling um, in their brine. So tahorim. So if a source of tuma touches the stem in that situation, it does not transmit tuma. The reason being is because the softening of the vegetable and of its stem in the course of the pickling makes the stem no longer serve the function of a yad of a handle, but rather it's just there for ornamental purposes and therefore it does not transmit tuma. In any event, the point that the Gemara is trying to make is, Amar Havayas the Rav Shmuel Kachazina Hacha. Rav Yehuda was so blown away by the complexity of that discussion in the Mishnah that he would say that this discussion is as, as complex to me as this shiurim that I used to hear from my teachers, Rav and Shmuel. So that shows you that he was really quite overtaken by the difficulty of the subject material. However, va'anan kamasninan bu'uksin tleiser mesivta. He says, but, but, but for us, nowadays, it's a piece of cake. We have 13 different forms of exposition on the Mishnah Nuksin. For us, it's, uh, yeah. it, it doesn't have that level of complexity. So you see that we study much more Torah than, than they did in the times of Rav Yehuda. And yet, ve'ilu Rav Yehuda ki havasholiv chad misane osamitra ve'anan ka mitzaharina nafshinu mitzavach kotzavchinan v'les damashkach bon. He says, but let me tell you, Rav Yehuda was such a tzaddik that when there would be a drought and he would begin, just begin a tainus, begin a fast, and you would take off your shoes to, uh, to begin the fasting. All he would have to do was take off one shoe, and immediately it would start to rain. God immediately answered his prayers. Where by contrast, today, we krechts, we kvetch, from hind till morgen, from, from evening till morning, from morning till night, we, we yell the whole day through, and no one's listening. It's like 
yelling at a wall, right? No, no one's listening. So Amar lay. so the question is, so then why is it that they are more privy to miracles than we if we learn more Torah? Amar lay kamei havu komastri nafshai akadusha sashem, anulo masrin and nefishin nafshin akadusha sashem. The answer is they would be most or nefesh. They would exert themselves to the nth degree to sanctify Hashem's name, but we do not go to those same extents. Now the Gemara brings an illustration to that point. He once saw a Gentile woman was wearing a karbalta, which is a very ostentatious shawl. The Aruch says that it's bright red. So here you see this woman drawing attention to herself in a very immodest fashion, wearing this bright red shawl in the marketplace. Sovered the Bas Yisrael, he thought that she's a Jewish girl and is breaching the mores of modesty. So come kare mina. So he tears off her shawl. He's going to, he's a kanoi, he's going to tear off her shawl. So igloi milsa de kusisi. Then it, then it was discovered, oh, what a mistake he made. She was a non-Jew. What right did he have to impose the standards of Tznius on a non-Jewish girl? So Shaimua Bar Azuzi, therefore he was assessed with damages and was forced to pay 400 zuz. Amar Lei Mashmech, he said to her, when he was paying her, I guess, in court, tell me, what's your name? Amar Lei Maton. So she said to him, my name is Maton or Mason. So Amar La, Mason, Mason, Arba Meazuzi Shavya. Oi, mason, mason, you cost me 400 zuz. Now, the Rashi gives two interpretations. The word mason, which sounds like mason, is 200 in Aramaic. So, 200, 200, you cost me 400. So, in other words, you double, double your name is what I had to pay. The other explanation that Rashi brings from the word mason means, like lahamtin, is to wait, to be patient. Had only I had been patient to find out your identity, I could have saved myself 400 zuz. Now, the conventional understanding of this Gemara, is that the Mesiris Nefesh of Rav Ada Bar Ahavas look to what great extents he went to reinforce the standards of Tznius within the community, so much so that he was prepared to go over to Abbas Yisrael and rip off in public and face the wrath of the community and rip off her shawl. <clears throat> I, I don't understand the Gemara that way. <laughs> And I'm going to I'm going to tell you how I I'm going to tell you how I teach the Gemara. Okay, the Mesiris Nefesh Al Kiddush Hashem is in the aftermath of the story. The Kiddush Hashem is the fact that he could have figured out a way to get out of paying this girl. He could have skipped town. He could have made up some excuse that it really wasn't me, or it, it, it was an accident, or whatever it was. But he readily admitted that I blew it and I made a mistake, and he made sure to pay much more than what the shawl's value was in order to be able to compensate her for her embarrassment and whatever discomfort he caused her. That was the Kiddush Hashem. That was the Mesiris Nefesh of Ravada Bar Ahava to make sure that a non-Jewish woman should not feel that the Jews are fanatics. That was the Kiddush Hashem. And that's the lesson for today that I believe we have to take from this story. If we're Moiser Nefesh in the eyes of the world to be Makadesh Im Shemaim, then we too will be privy to miracles. Rav Gidel Havya, okay, but now of course many people are welcome to disagree with my interpretation. It's a personal interpretation. Rav Gidel Havya Ragil Dahava Ka'azl Vyasiv Ashari Ditfila. Rav Gidel had a custom that he would sit nearby the mikveh and Amr Lahu Hachi Tevilu Vahachi Tevilu. And he would instruct the women, and it's mashma from the Gemara, as we'll see in just a moment, that he was actually watching the women as they were getting undressed, preparing to go into the mikvah. And he would say, make sure that you put all of your body inside and make sure that uh, you, you're table like this and get your hair down, dunk, and everything like that. He was really quite involved in the process. So, Amri Le Rabon and Lo Kamistafi Mar Miyetzer Aren't you worried about your own Yet Sahara that when you see women in various stages of undress, you're going to be in some way tempted by lust? Amr Luhu, Damyan Beapoi, Kikaki Chivri. He says, No, these women look to me like white geese. In other words, my Yet Sahara is completely subdued or subjugated um, um, when it comes to these issues because my, I'm completely Lashem Shemai. Uh, and we have a similar language in the Gemara and Ksuvis with another great 
rabbinic figure who used to dance with the kala on his shoulders. And the Chachamim said, how can you do such a thing? And someone has said, could we do it as well? He said, no. He says, if they look, if the legs of the kala are like white geese for you, then it's okay. You have to be on that madrega. If you're not on that madrega, then you got to put up the, the ten-foot machis. Have a marasai, people would say. He's, a, he's the god, he's Rav Gidl. There's no Mara sign if you're Rav Gidl. Rav Yochanan have a Ragil da have a Ka'azil v'yasiv ashari de Tvila. Next story, Rav Yochanan used to sit at the gates of the mikvah, <coughs> not to watch the women as they were going in, but the opposite. Amar kisalkan benos Yisrael va'astin mitvila mistaklun bi v'nihavi luhuzara de Shapiri kavasi. He says, I want when they, when they come out of the mikvah, before they're intimate with their husbands, they should look at my nice, beautiful punim, so that when they, when, when they're conceiving, they'll have the thought of something beautiful. When they have, um, and therefore, they'll have beautiful children like my beautiful punim, because Rabbi Yechonon was an exceptionally beautiful man. So Amr le Rabbanan, lo kamistafi mar me'ina visha. So the Chachamim said to him, "Aren't you worried about an eye in hara?" The Bach asked the question, "What about the problem of yetsar hara?" In other words, why, why, would, why didn't they ask him about, aren't you worried about lustful thoughts when you see women come out of the mikvah? So the Bach says, because Rabbi Yochanan had droopy eyelids, he could close his eyes. He didn't, he didn't actually see the women. He just made sure that they saw him. So anyway, so Amr Lahu, Ana Mizara de Yosef Ka Asina, Dodoshalta Be Eina Bisha. He says, no, I'm not worried because I am from the descendants of Yosef. And Yosef's descendants <coughs> are protected from an eye in horror. From any evil eye, the siv bein paras Yosef, bein paras alei oyim, that uh, the beautiful son is Joseph, uh, the beautiful son who is alei oyim that goes up on the eye. So the Amar Rebbe Avo al Tikri alei oyim ela olei oyim. That means that it uh, it 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 goes it transcends above the eye. That Yosef is free from the evil gaze of the eye in her. Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Chanina, Amar Mehacha. He says we learn it from here. The Yidgula Rov, the care of Haaretz. That when Yaakov blesses Ephraim and Menashe, the progeny of Yosef, he says, may they multiply like fish in the earth. Madogim shebiyom mayim and mechasin aleihem, vein ayin har shaletis bahem, abzar shal Yosef, vein ayin har shaletis bahem. That just like fish are covered by the waters of the sea, and therefore no eye can gaze upon them to give them an ayin hara, so too this, the descendants of Yosef are free from the ayin hara. The iba is ema ayin shalaratsa salazun mima sheino shalo, ain ayin hara shaletis bo. The third of, uh, source of how we know that Yosef is free from the ayin hara is not based on a pasuk, but rather on a svara. The svara is that Yosef averted his gaze from the wife of Potiphar and did not allow himself to derive any pleasure from looking upon the alluring, uh, uh, attractive figure of the wife of Potiphar, and as a reward, Hashem rewarded him that no eye would be able to affect him adversely in any way. Again, Mida Keneged Mida, he didn't allow his eyes to wander, and so therefore Hashem will not allow eyes to wander upon him adversely. Okay, so let's go on to the next mission. The Mishnah says, Nashim va'avadim u'ketanim peturim mikriyashma u'minat filin that women, servants, and minors are exempt from kriyashma and from tefillin. However, v'chayovin v'tefila u'vimezuza u'vabirkas hamazim but they are obligated in tefillah. Anytime you find the word tefillah in the Mishnah or the Gemara, what does it mean? It means shmon esrei. It means the amida. And mezuzah, they're obligated in the midst of mezuzah on their homes, and they're obligated in birkas hamazon to say grace after meals. Now, I just want to clarify something. I'm, I may be overstating the obvious, but when a Mishnah provides you with a list, and it says women, slaves, and children, so one might be uh, uh, one might be tempted to say, well, this is an example of the misogyny of the sages, who group women together with slaves and children, right? But that's not the case. All we're doing is providing you with a certain halachic category of people who have a limited scope of commandments. Women and people who are indentured servants are only similar in one respect. They're both putter from mitzvah saseh shazman grama. They're exempt from time-bound command, positive commandments. In all other respects, they have nothing in common. Okay? Let's make sure we understand that. 
All right, now, the question of Ketanim, of our Mishnah, is a big machlokis Rashi and Tosfis. <coughs> Rashi says that the word Ketanim over here means Ketanim Shehigiu Lechinuch, that they are already of educable age, and yet they are still potter from Kriyashma and from Tefillin. Tosfis is bothered with this issue because he says, why should a child who's reached the age of Chinuch be a potter from, why should a father be potter from training him to recite Kriyashma? And so therefore, Taisva says we're talking about children who have not yet reached the age of Chinuch. So this is one discussion in the Rishonim, but uh, we're going to go on. <clears throat> and what about, so, what about Shota? A Shota is potter from all of these things. A Shota does not occupy the same status uh, in, for these issues as a, a Isha, Evid, and, and Kata. These are all people that are have some level of cognizance to make them Chayiv and Mitzvahs. Now, Kriyashma. Uh, obviously, the uh, the Isha and the Evid are fully have the full full and full IQ of any of, of any other male counterpart, and the child has reached the age of Chinuch, even if he doesn't have full mental capacity because he's still a child, but has enough that he's a Gil Chinuch, and you have to teach him. Kriyashma Pshita. So the Gemara's question is to tell me that we're obli- women are obli- women and servants are obligated in Kriyashma. That doesn't that seem obvious? After all, if we have a general principle that all mitzvah sasei shahazman gurama, excuse me, isn't it fairly obvious that they're exempt? If we have a principle that all mitzvah sasei shahazman gurama, time bound, positive commandments, there's an exemption for women in avodim, so then since Kriyashma is a time related mitzvah, women should be potter. So why does the Mishnah have to spell out the specifics if we already know the general rule? The Gemara answers, yeah, the Gemara asks, Mr. Seish says, Man Grama, who behold, Mr. Seish says, Man Grama, Nashim Peturos. The Gemara answers, Mahu de Te, Mahol, Vispa, Malchus, Shamayim, Kamash Malan. I might have thought that Kriyashma, even though it's a time bound mitzvah, has such an important daily ritual because it involves the acceptance of the yoke of heaven upon himself, then therefore, even though it's time bound because it says, Bishoch, Bechol, Vekumecha, when you lie down and when you arise, Nevertheless, women should be obligated to recite it, and therefore, kamash malan, that women are potter. Uminat tefillin, that women are potter from, women and servants are, and children are potter from tefillin. Pshita, that too is obvious. Again, it's a time-bound mitzvah. It only applies in the day and not at night. So, mahu detei mahol v'iska shlemezuza, kamash malan. You might have thought that since the Torah, in discussing the law of tefillin, makes it adjacent immediately to the law of mezuzah, you see that the tefillin and mezuzah come right after the other, and therefore, just like women are obligated in mezuzah, they're obligated in tefillin as well, kamash malan that they're not. And they're obligated in prayer, meaning in Shemona Esrei, and the reason is, the ninhu. It's because every person has to ask Hashem for mercy, and mercy does not knows no time bounds. And some take out the next three lines, but we'll read them anyway. I might have thought that women are exempt, because it says by prayer, that I will pray to you, Hashem, evening, morning, and afternoon. And therefore, one might have thought that there's this a semblance of time relation when it comes to prayer because we have three set times to pray and therefore commitsvah as man grama dummy therefore might have thought it was it's a time related mitzvah. Kamash Malan so comes along the mission to tell me that it's not a time bound mitzvah. Let me just over, once again overstate the obvious that women have the same obligations of prayer as men, midioraisa. The only difference between men and women are the time bound aspects of prayer. But the mitzvah of prayer applies equally to men and to women. Again, it's only the time-bound aspects of prayer. So women are exempt from praying at specific times, but they're obligated to pray on a daily basis. According to most poskim, women are obligated to daven shachris and mincha every single day. The only difference <coughs> is that myriv, they don't have to daven, because since myriv originally was a rishus, and then later it was upgraded by Klal Yisrael to a chayva, to an obligatory prayer, women never accepted upon themselves that obligatory ritual. But shacharis and mincha, women are supposed to daven just like men. Also, as far as to the extent of how much they have to say of shacharis, of psukit zimra, and so forth, that also is discussed by the poskim. But let's be very clear that there's no dispensation that a woman doesn't have to daven. 
I noticed that perhaps in some circles, women are, are more lax in this than perhaps that they should be, and that's why I just raised this issue. Couldn't it be considered that, that Shachris and Mincha are in some way time-bound, albeit it has a large uh, time -bound. Yes, you could argue that they're time-bound. You could argue that, but that seems to be not the way that the post can come out as far as the women's obligation. Women have an obligation to daven twice daily. If a woman, uh, it certainly, uh, she certainly fulfills her, her basic obligation if she only prays once a day. But the proper thing is to pray twice a day. So why can't a woman be counted for uh, Mizumin, let's say, because she's obligated? Mizumin, you wait for the seventh parak of brachos. That's a full discussion. You get that's a totally, that's later. We're only in the third parak. <laughs> why is she obligated? Why can't she sit around and sleep then? Because she's not obligated in tefillah b'tzibur. She's only obligated in personal tefillah. Okay. Uva mezuzah. She's obligated in mezuzah. She's obligated in the mitzvah of mezuzah b'shita. Again, isn't this obvious? There's no time-bound nature to mezuzah. Ma'u the same. Ahol ve'iskash l'tal m'toyer kamash malon. I might have thought that since mezuzah is connected to tal m'toyer, and because it says in one of the parshios of Shema, it says that right after the mitzvah of mezuzah, "V'limadatemos son es b'neichem ledaber bam." You shall teach your children the law, the, the Torah. And Chazal say, "Es b'neichem v'lo es b'noseichem." There's only a mitzvah of Talmud Torah <coughs> for your sons and not your daughters. And therefore, I might have thought that even though mezuzah is not a time-bound mitzvah, since it's connected to Talmud Torah. And Talmud Torah is only an obligation for men and not for males and not for females. So too mezuzah. Kamash malon that no. Do not do not make that uh, uh, extension. Uvebir kasamazon. They're obligated in, in benching. Pshita. Isn't this too obvious? Because there's no time relation to uh, benching. You just eat after you eat. Uh, bench after you eat. Ma'u detei maholu chasiv b'seis Hashem lachem ba'erev basar lechol v'lechem ba'boker lispoa k'mitzvah sasei shezman grama dami kamash malon. I might have thought that when we look in the Torah, we find that there are regular daily patterns of eating. The Torah says that God will give you meat at night, He'll give you the slav at night to eat, and He'll give you the manna in the morning. So it sounds like the two daily meals have a, 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 an evening component and a morning component, and therefore one might have thought that there's a time-bound nature to eating, and by extension, there's a time-bound nature to benching, which comes after eating. Kamash Malan, that it's not that way. Any time you eat, you have to bench, and therefore it's not, not a mitzvah, let's say, Shazman Grom. And isn't, isn't there a minimum amount of time? Yes, there, there is, but that's related to the f meal. It's not related to the, to the time of eating. Amar Avada Bar Ahava, Noshim Chayavos Bekiddush Hayom Devar Torah. Women have a Torah obligation to make Kiddush. Friday night. Now, we're going to talk about whether the woman can make Kiddush for the Mishpacha or not. We'll talk about that in just a second. But women can make, have an obligation, Midiaraisa, to make Kiddush, <coughs> to sanctify the day by making a declaration of today is the Sabbath. There's a famous kasha discussed by the Poskim, which is you, the argument should be made that a man who's gone to Shul Friday night cannot, make, cannot be Motzi, his wife, in Kiddush. Why? Because when he's gone to shul to daven Mayrev, he says vayachulu, so he's already midiaraisa bin yotze kiddush, and all he all he has left is the derabanan dekachiv of reciting kiddush al hayayin. Whereas the woman didn't daven Mayrev, so her obligation of kiddush hayom is midiaraisa. How can a someone who's only chayiv derabanan be motzi someone who's chayiv midiaraisa? So that's the famous question, and the and the achronim discuss this issue, but the lamaskana. There's no problem in a man being motzi a woman for Kiddush. So frak the Gemara, Amai mitzvah sasei shazman grama, hu v'chol mitzvah sasei shazman grama, noshim peturos. Why should a woman be obligated to sanctify Shabbos? After all, Shabbos is a time-bound commandment. Amar Abaya midar Abonin. Abaya says it's only rabbinic that they have this obligation. So Amar lei rava v'ha devar Torah ka Amar. First of all, ravada bar Ava said it's a biblical obligation. That's number one. V'od kol mitzvah sasei nichayavinu midar Abonin. And furthermore, according to your argument, that even though it's a mitzvah sasei shazman grama, the Chachamim added this obligation. So let them add the obligation for every mitzvah sasei shazman grama. And that simply is not the case. Ela Omar Rava, Omar Kroz, Zachar Vishamar, Kol Sheyeshnu Bishmira, Yeshnu Bishchira, Vaninashi Hol Vishnu Bishmira, Yeshnu Bishchira. The answer is the very famous Zachar Vishamar. In the first 
time the Ten Commandments is written in the Torah, it says, Zohar es Yom HaShabbos L'Kadosh, remember the Sabbath day to, to, to sanctify it. And the word Zohar implies, do the positive commandments involved with Shabbos. In Parshas Vo'es Chanan, when the Ten Commandments are written again, it says, Shomer es Yom HaShabbos L'Kadosh, that observe the Shabbos day to sanctify it. The word Shamor implies, observe the negative commandments of Shabbos. The, everyone agrees that women are obligated in time-bound negative commandments. And the fact that the Torah connects the Zohar and the Shomer, the positive to the negative, teaches me that anyone who is obligated in the negative commandments of Shabbos, and that includes women, is also obligated in the positive commandments of Shabbos. So even though women are exempt from mitzvah sasei as man grama, the exception is Shabbos, because of this drasha of Zohar v'Shomer. So Amr le Ravina le Rava, Nashim b'Birkas Hamazon de'Oraisa o de'Rabbanon. So now Ravina says to Rava, let me ask you another question. Women, in the obliga- their obligation of Birkas Hamazon, is that a rabbinic obligation or is that a biblical obligation? Now we just got through saying that this is not a mitzvah sasei she'az man grama, so why would I think it's only a rabbinic obligation? So we have here a machlokas Rashi and Tosfos. Rashi says it's because women were not given a portion in Eretz Yisrael. And the Torah says, Bless God for, in Birkas HaMazun for the good land that he gave you. And if women never received a portion of inheritance of land in Eretz Yisrael, so then they may be exempt from benching Midir Ais, and it's only Midir Rabbanon. I Rashi asked about Benoz. You could ask me out loud, don't worry. The, the, Benoz Salafchad, I... But they didn't receive their own portion. They received their father's portion. So they received it only vicariously for, for their father. That's why it's not considered to be their own portion. So therefore, you could argue that women are not obligated in Birka Samos and Midir Isa. Tosfus disagrees, and Tosfus says, by that argument, Kohanim and Levim should also be exempt from Birka Samos. That would make me feel very unhappy. So therefore, comes along Tosfus and says, no, we're going to learn later on, and when we go to the seventh parak of, uh, of Brachos, we're going to learn that you have to mention in the benching, you have to talk about what's called bris v'tori. You have to talk about val brischa shechasam to You have to talk about the circumcision that I, has been embedded within, my, within right. my flesh, the covenant embedded in my flesh. And you have to talk about val toraschha shalim adetanu and the Torah that you have taught us. Those are integral parts of the birka samazim. Women have no mitzvah of bris milah. They have no mitzvah of talmud Torah. And therefore there's an argument to say that they should be exempt from birka samazim as well. That's the reason why our question is, is it their rice or their abon? So the Gemara now, first of all, says, Lamai nafkamina, la fuke rabbi midei chovasa. The nafkamina would be, can a woman be motzi males in their obligation of benching? Can you have a woman be motzi men in benching? Iomart der raisa, asi der raisa, mafik der raisa. If you tell me they have a Torah obligation of benching, so then yes, they could be motzi others. Ela iomart der rabbonan, so my. But if they're only rabbinically obligated, then they can't be motzi, those who have a biblical obligation to recite the bench. So therefore the question is, what's the halacha? So Tashma, so come and listen to the following Bryce. The MS Amru. Verily, or in truth, the rabbi said, Ben Mivarech Le Avi, Vevid Mivarech Le Rabbo, Visha Mivarechas Labaila. That in truth, a son can lead his father or be motzi his father in the benching, and Evid could do the same for his master, and a wife could do the same for her husband. However, However, the sages said, May a curse befall a man who has to rely upon his wife to be motzi him in the birka samas. Let's just understand this for a second. This Again, this is not misogyny here. What Chazal are essentially teaching us is, is that a man has an obligation of literacy. He has an obligation of Talmud Torah. He's got to be Jewishly literate. A woman has no obligation of Jewish literacy. And therefore, if she shows her, she has a greater level of literacy than her husband by being able to be motzi him, because he, re- he needs to rely on her to be, mo- to be yotze, then this is a, a, a tremendously humiliating for the man. Look, my wife who doesn't have the mitzvah of literacy is more literate than I am, that's the embarrassment, right? It's not the embarrassing, oh, it's a woman. No, it's the embarrassment is, is because she's not mechuyiv in Talmud Torah, yet she knows more Torah than I do. That's the embarrassment to the man. So what do you see from here? So, so you see that a woman could be motzi her husband in benching, but it's not appropriate. So you see that she must have a level of being motzi, because otherwise she could not be motzi her husband. 
Eliyah Mart de Rabon and Asi de Rabon and Omatik de Oraisa, but if you're going to tell me that her obligation is only rabbinic, then why would the Brisa allow for a woman who's only rabbinically obligated to be Motsi, her husband, who is biblically obligated to say Birka Samazan? So the Gemara says, your argument makes no sense because the Litai Mech Katan Bar who else is allowed to be Motsi, an adult male? A child, a minor, can be Motsi, his father, in benching. That certainly is not a biblical <coughs> obligation. So how can you tell me that you see from this brisa that a woman has a biblical obligation when she's grouped together with a minor? So, The answer is, says the Gemara, that what we're discussing here is when the adult male had less than the required shear to be obligated in benching midiorizes. We're going to see momentarily that you're only obligated to eat, to bench, when you ve'achalta v'savata. You have to eat and be sated. You have to eat a full meal. And then does it say uve'rachta? Then you have an obligation to bench. A friend of mine once told me he was eating at a restaurant in Borough Park, and the sign on the door said, Yachalta v'savata v'shilamta uveirachta. <laughs> Make sure you pay before you bench, right? Uh, so, the, the, so you're only biblically obligated to say birkas amazam once you've been sated. But we have a rabbinic obligation to bench uh, even after we've only eaten a smaller amount. So maybe what we're talking about in this price is a situation where the male ate less than the kedei sevia, less than the satiable amount. And therefore, he's only rabbinically obligated to bench. And that's why either his son or his wife can be motzim in benching. But in reality, it could be that a woman only has a rabbinic obligation. You have no, so therefore, you have no raya from here. I just want to add one more thing. And that is, going back to this issue of a woman saying Kiddush Friday night. What did we just see from the Gemara? Technically, a woman could be motzi or husband in benching, but may a curse befall a man who has to rely on his wife's literacy instead of his own literacy to be able to bench. According to the Mishnah Bura, the same principle applies to a woman saying Kiddush. A woman can be motzi, her husband, and her entire family by making Kiddush Friday night for the entire Mishpacha. Halachically, it's perfectly legitimate. But the principle of Tavo Me'era, that may a curse befall a man who has to rely on his wife's literacy to be, to be motzi, the family, in Kiddush, that's not the appropriate message that you want to be able to send about yourself. This is what the Mishnah Bura says, and therefore he says it's inappropriate for a woman to make Kiddush uh, for her family, for the, for the family in the presence of the husband. So um, there are certain egalitarian circles within Orthodoxy who feel at liberty to um, not be aware of this Mishnah Bura. But I just wanted to make sure that you, that you understand that this halacha does exist and that this is the Talmudic basis for it. I certainly have no objection. There are some families where the husband makes Kiddush and the wife makes Hamotzi. That's beautiful. It's lovely. There's nothing wrong with it. If you'd like to do that, that's fine. But Kiddush, I believe, is in the same realm, as at least according to the Mishnah Bura, as the Birka Samazan issue. How about the son making Kiddush? Because the son is grouped with the wife <coughs> in the same curse. That's true. It's the, the head of the household is the one who should make Kiddush. It doesn't look right if anyone other than the head of the household mm-hmm. makes, makes Kiddush. Yeah, Second. They could have said also that he had lost his voice. If the husband lost his voice, then she can take home. It's not to right? say that uh, that he didn't have enough to eat because they didn't have to make that argument. They could have said no, 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 no. If he's biblically obligated, right. then even if he lost his voice, he can't be yotze with his wife's benching. He can't because she can't be motzi him. You don't have the din of shamea kaona only applies if the person saying the words is a bar himself. Even if you lost your voice, it wouldn't work. Okay, havdala is a separate issue. A woman can make havdala technically, but according to the poskim, she should not. Let's go weiter. Darash Rav Avira zimnen amr la mishmei de Rabbi Ami v'zimnen amr la mishmei de Rabbi Asi. Amru malachi hasharis lifnei hakadosh baruch that the angel said before Hashem. Ribona Shalom Kasuv Bisorasecha, Master of the Universe, it is written in your Torah, Asher Lo Yisafon and Velo Yikach Shocha, Vahalo Atanose Fanim Li Israel. It says, You are a God who shows no favoritism and does not take bribes, and yet you show favoritism to the Jewish people. May God show favoritism upon you, may He shine His face upon you. We just had this very same question asked at the end of Masechas Nida. Who remembers it? Okay, remember? So there, 
it was not the Malachi Hasharis who asked this question, it was the Chachme Alexandria who asked this question, and the Gemara gave a totally different answer. So this is not the time. I just want to make just make point out that our so Amr Lahem, so Hashem says back to the Malachim, Bechiloas Afanim Li Israel. How can I not show favoritism to the Jewish people? Shekosafti Lahem Bitar, because I wrote in the Torah Vechalta Visavati Rachlishim Alokecha. I wrote that you only have an obligation of benching if you've been sated by a full meal. And they are machmir upon themselves that they bench even after they've only eaten either a kezayis or a kebetz. It's a machlokas Rav Meir and Rebbe Yehuda. But the, everyone agrees that even if you've eaten less than a satiable meal, that you still have an obligation of benching. We paskin that even only after a kezayis, a person has an obligation to bench. Okay, let's go on to the next Mishnah. Balkeri maharher belibo ve'enu mevarech lo lefaneha ve'lo la'achareha. Now, this Mishnah, we have to put it into a historical context. Ezra HaSofer, the builder of the second temple, made a takana. And his takana was that anyone who has had a seminal emission, either through the natural intercourse with his wife or through a nocturnal emission, it doesn't make a difference for these purposes. Any seminal emission makes a person unfit to study Torah or to recite words of Torah. And therefore, a person has to go to the mikveh, and only after he goes to the mikveh can he recite words of Torah. And the reason why he did that was because he didn't want, as we'll learn later on, he didn't want there to be a wanton uh, kind of, um, uh, of over-sexualization uh, of the Jewish people, especially of Talmidei Chachamim. And therefore, uh, he instituted this practice to, to create a certain level of chastity even among husbands and wives. So this was the Takana. The Takana was later rescinded, which is why it does not apply Bizman Hazet. It does not apply today. Okay? But this was, it is in this context that the Mishnah is speaking to us. And it says as follows, a Balkari is allowed to only think in his, in his thoughts about Kriya Shema. He's not allowed to recite the words out loud because he's a Balkari. And even thinking, he does not make the brachas. Even in his thoughts, he should not make the blessings of Kriya Shema. He only thinks about the words of Kriya Shema themselves. And for benching, once again, he only may think the words of benching, but that's only for after eating, but before eating, he does not make a bracha, in, even in his thoughts, on food. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Mivarech Lifnei Molachrem, and Rabbi Yehuda disagrees, and he says, you make a bracha both before and after in your thoughts. At least that's the simple shot. The Gemara will explain Rabbi Yehuda's position. The Gemara now says, Omer Ravina, Zoso Meres, Hirahur Kedibor Dami. We can adduce from this Mishnah that thinking in your mind words of Torah is tantamount to reciting them. Di'isal Kedaita Chlav Kedibor Dami, Lama Maharher. Because if it, it does not have the same effect as recitation, then what's the benefit of thinking them? If, it, if it's completely invalid, it doesn't result in the same benefit of recitation, then what's the point? So, Elamai, hear her kedibor dami, yotzi bisfasav. So the Gemara says, well, then what's the alternative? Then thinking words of Torah is tantamount to reciting them. So then you might as well just recite them already. If you've already got a dispensation to think, so then you might as well recite so the Gemara says, no, Kedashkechan Bisinai. No, because we find at Har Sinai that because there were actually words of the Torah being pronounced, being uttered at Maimat Har Sinai at the time of Kabbalah the Torah, God utters the words themselves and the Jews hear the words and it's as if they're saying them themselves. HaKadosh Baruch Hu required them to go to mikvah and to be porish from their wives and separate from their wives. So you see that actual recitation is not permitted for someone who's a Balkari, and therefore the Chachamim cannot permit someone to actually recite, but they said that thinking, even though it has the halachic validity as far as being Yotze, the mitzvah of recitation, but at least it's not actual <coughs> recitation, and therefore since we find by Harsinai that you're not allowed to, a Balkari is not allowed to recite words, they needed to respect that, that exemplar. For Rav Chizda, Amar, Rav Chizda says no. Hear her lav kedibor dami. And he says no. That thinking words of Torah 
is not tantamount to their recitation. The Yisal Kaday Tochir Kadibur Dami Yosi B'Safasif. He has the opposite argument. He says, if it is tantamount to recitation, then you might as well recite it. So Elamai Hir Lav Kadibur Dami Lama Mahar Her. So if you're going to tell me the alternative is that it's not like recitation, so then what's the point of thinking them? You're not accomplishing anything. So the Gemara answers, Amar Rabbi Lazar, Kadesh Shalai Yikola Olam Oiskim Abo Vuhu Yoshe Vuhu Bato. The answer is, is that it's not, it's not proper for everyone else to be engaged in, in reciting Kriya Shema and davening, and this guy just being sitting and doing nothing. So he should at least participate with the tzibor in engaging in words of Torah and prayer, even though he can't say them out loud. That's the purpose for thinking them. Frek the Gemara v'nigros v'pirka achrina. Well, then why does Davka have to be Kriya Shema? Let him think about some other... Um, uh, passage of prayer or Torah. Why does it have to be Davka Kriyashma? Because he should be doing the same thing that the Tzibur is doing. When the Tzibur is reciting Kriyashma, he should be participating with them in thinking those words, even though he can't recite them. I, but uh, but uh, Shmon Esrei also is something that the Tzibor engages in, and we learn in the Mishnah, <coughs> we'll see this later on, that if a person started Shmon Esrei and then realizes, hey, wait a minute, I'm not allowed to be davening, I'm a Balkari, then what should he do? He should abbreviate his prayers in order to finish as quickly as possible. He says an abridged version of the prayer. The Gemara says, time of the Askel, hello Askel, lo Yaskel. So we see that he's only allowed to complete the prayers because he's already begun them. But if you haven't yet begun, you're not permitted to begin davening Shmona Esrei as a Balkari, even though the Tzibur is engaged in this. So why don't you say this, what's good for Kriyashma should be good for Shmona Esrei as well. So the Gemara answers, Shani Tefillah Delespa Malchus Shemaim. The answer is, is that Kriyashma occupies a certain <coughs> elevated status because it involves accepting upon yourself the yoke of heaven and mentioning that God is king of the universe. Shmona Esrei doesn't have that declaration that Hashem is Melech HaOlam, and therefore it's not as important, and therefore it's not necessary to be thinking the words of prayer when the rest of the tzibur is doing it. But what about benching? Why then do we say that by benching a balkari should be mahar here as well? There there's also no malchus shemaim, there's no accepting upon yourself that God's, uh, uh, God's kingship over yourself. And yet there's still an imperative that as a Balkari you have to re- uh, think about it in your thoughts. So, Ela Kriyashma Birka Samazan De Araisa Tfilo De Rabban. It concludes the Gemara that the real div- uh, divider between Kriyashma and Birka Samazan on one side and all other prayers on the other side is that Kriyashma and Birka Samazan are both biblical commandments. And as such, even though you're a Balkari, you at least have to be thinking it in your thoughts even though you can't recite it. <coughs> other prayers, other passages, since they're only rabbinic uh, in their obligation, you don't even have to think of, about them when you're a Balkari. And this is where we'll hold it for today. Have a wonderful day.